Hello wrestling fans. The Pro Wrestle Machine is back with another program. An interesting bit of history from 1997 when both major promotions experienced backstage scuffles. No one was bit. No dogs needed rescue in these instances that happened way back in 1997. But without further ado. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, June 23, 1997 Wrestling Observer Newsletter, WWE Stars in Auto Accident. Michael's probably returning after Brawl. WCW Shatters Records, more. By Observer Staff. Four WWF wrestlers were involved in an auto accident on the late afternoon of June 15, which left them all hospitalized, but as luck would turn out, with none suffering serious injuries and all but one checked themselves out of the hospital that night. The wrestlers involved were Psycho Sid, Sid Aoudi Doug Furness, who suffered the most serious injuries, Phil LaFon and Flash Funk, Charles Skaggs. The accident occurred on the way to Ottawa, where the four were scheduled to wrestle that night, from Montreal, where the wrestlers were stationed after working the previous night in Toronto. Sid was driving a rented Lincoln Continental as a speed described as being around 100 miles per hour and apparently was adjusting the sunroof and the car went out of control, hit the shoulder of the road and rolled four times about a mile from the Ontario border on the way from Montreal to Ottawa near Pointe Fortune, Quebec. The car was destroyed to the point of being unrecognizable and all four wrestlers were taken to Hawkesbury, Ontario General Hospital in an ambulance. The original fears were that Sid was badly injured in the accident but as it turned out he suffered some facial cuts and was suffering from a major headache from a concussion and experienced some numbness in his arms and legs as he apparently re-aggravated his bad back. Furness was the most seriously injured, suffering a separated and broken shoulder and underwent surgery on June 17 in San Diego to find out the extent of the damage. Lafon suffered a concussion and numerous cuts and bruises all over his body they had to shave a lot of his head in the hospital to get out the glass that got in his forehead. Funk came out of it the most unscathed, just shaken up. The incident wasn't acknowledged on television the next night. Funk is expected back in action for the house shows this weekend but the rest will be out of action for a few weeks, and in the case of Furnace, likely longer than that. After a week in which it appeared the future of Shawn Michaels and the World Wrestling Federation was uncertain in the wake of a legitimate backstage fight with Bret Hart, it now appears Michaels will be returning in a few weeks. Michaels, 31, had cussed out Vince McMahon, reportedly saying something to the effect of I'll never work for your fucking ass again while leaving the Hartford Civic Center about a half hour before the live Raw television show was to begin on June 9th. This came after a fight with Hart which was quickly broken up, but not before he had a large clump of hair pulled from his head. Supposedly Hart and Michaels began a heated discussion largely about Michaels' now infamous Sunny Days remark on television, saying he'd gone over the line. Supposedly Michaels responded with a cocky what are you going to do about it? type of remark which set Hart off and started the fight. The general feeling was that Michaels was provoking an incident with his retort, although Hart wasn't considered blameless, C was the one who threw the first punch. Michaels was telling people on Tuesday that he was done with the WWF and would sit out the next four years of his contract rather than return. Logically that wasn't going to happen and the question was more when he'd return, although Michaels could have sat out a long period of time since he received a seven-figure inheritance from a wrestling fan of his that passed away and has made a lot of money in the WWF over the past five years as a singles headliner. The WWF claimed Michaels had breached his contract by walking out in Hartford and he didn't appear on the weekend shows in Montreal and Toronto where he was scheduled in singles matches against Davy Boy Smith for the European title. The contract breach basically meant that the WWF wasn't going to have to pay him his estimated $15,000 per week guarantee until he agreed to return. As the week went on, Michaels disconnected his telephone making it impossible for WWF officials to attempt to smooth things over with him. However, by the end of the week, his feelings seemingly changed. Michaels' attorney sent the WWF a letter saying that Michaels hadn't breached his contract, but that he was injured in the fight with Hart claiming both knee and neck injuries and that he would be unable to wrestle for four to six weeks. He requested a meeting with McMahon in San Antonio on June 19 for both sides to settle their differences and the WWF is making plans now with the idea that Michaels will start back around the latter part of July. Plans seem to be from a storyline standpoint to keep Michaels and Hart apart so it isn't like they'll turn this into an angle for a SummerSlam match due to problems as obviously it's a match that people are interested in seeing. On the weekend Livewire and Superstars cable shows, they read a statement from Jim Ross talking about the situation, saying that Michaels was in a contract breach and had seemingly left the WWF and that neither man was injured in the fight. On Raw on June 16th, 
after hearing from Michael's attorney over the weekend, they opened the show saying that neither of those statements on the weekend television turned out to be true, that Michaels would return to the WWF, and perhaps be on television the following week, that Hart was expected on television the following week. Hart wanted to do a live interview on the June 16th Raw to turn his fight into a wrestling angle and give his side of the situation in his typical semi-shooting work fashion but for whatever reason, likely to avoid antagonizing Michaels, it was decided against using Hart on the live show for fear he might say something Michaels would take the wrong way on a live interview. It was also said on television that both men were injured in the fight, citing Michaels' aforementioned injuries and that Hart re-aggravated his knee injury, He's expected back on June 28 for the Anaheim House show using that as the reason he wasn't at Raw although they did show a tape of him doing an interview from June 14 in Toronto. The situation with the Tag Team Championship was announced as them having a tournament on Raw, which began on June 16, with the tournament winners facing Austin and a partner of his choosing in a title match. This idea was formulated when it appeared Michaels wasn't going to be around, but since the tournament was already put on paper, with the idea Michaels will be around, they decided to go with it, and Michaels may or may not be Austin's partner when that match rolls around. With just three weeks to go until the Calgary pay-per-view show, the lineup for that show is very much in the air. The only match officially announced is the main event, which is now scheduled as Brett and Owen Hart and Jim Neidhart and Brian Pillman and Davy Boy Smith vs. Goldust and Ken Shamrock and Steve Austin and Legion of Doom. Goldust was put in Sid's original spot in a change that was made before the auto accident, don't know why that change was made perhaps Goldust was put in to do the job since they may not have wanted to beat Sid again perhaps they just felt it would be a more attractive show with a Sid vs Vader match underneath. Since we don't know the extent of Sid's injuries, the match with Vader has yet to be announced nor do we know at press time if it will happen. Vader himself has not returned after surgery on his nose and he was originally scheduled back for the Canadian shows over the weekend. They shot the angle to lead to the Undertaker vs Ahmed Johnson WWF title match on the June 16th Raw, the other scheduled match that should be etched in stone is Mankind vs. Hunter Hearst Helmsley. In Japan it was announced that Great Sasuke would face Takamichi Noku on the Calgary pay-per-view, and that is also planned to happen, although the final details on that match hadn't been solidified at last word. World Championship Wrestling shattered all attendance and gate records for the Quad Cities with its Great American Bash pay-per-view show on June 15, from the mark of the Quad in Moline, Illinois. The show drew 9,613 fans, 8,538 paying $142,118, which would have broken the area's attendance record set back in the early 60s. The show was about 500 tickets shy of a legitimate sellout and drew an additional $66,000 in merchandise. It was a rather uneventful show as far as advancing the storyline, and got a mixed response. I thought it was a good show, mixing up good, bad and average matches, most of which came across better than they figured to be on paper, with largely strong booking that had a purpose and storylines within the matches. Some of the finishes left something to be desired, and it was an overall very good announcing performance by Tony Schiavone as the host, and although the brain is showing that his brain isn't what it once was, at no point was Dusty Rhodes his stereotypical overbearing personality and Mike Tenney did a great job in the opener. From an organizational standpoint, it's a night and day difference with Terry Taylor running things as the announcers fed the eventual storylines much better than when they appeared to go out and call matches with no clue as to what is going on. Not to say that even under these circumstances that Bobby Heenan was all there although he only made one major faux pas, still not understanding the tap submission rule, which was one of the main things this show was designed to get over. In particular, after the replay showed Meng tapping for Chris Benoit's crossface, Heenan was still asking if Meng had submitted or if the referee had stopped the match because Meng had passed out. you think after not understanding the tap out on Nitro two weeks back with Barbarian, that he'd have figured it out by now. With three tap out finishes and only one DQ ending, the booking was often solid in that several undercard matches built up a specific story and paid off on it at the end. However, matches won, Ultimo Dragon vs. Psychosis, 4, Glacier vs. Wrath, and 7, Steve McMichael vs. Kevin Green, at almost the same finish, the old outside interference backfires, which was a little much for one card. Going off the air without an explanation as to what happened to Ric Flair, when he simply disappeared defied all credibility. And at exactly how many referees were knocked out in the Diamond Dallas Page vs. Randy Savage match, which was only made worse because as Savage was dropping referees, it was looking way too similar to the Steve Austin vs. Shawn Michaels match that took place seven days earlier. 
Tony Schiavone opened the show describing it as the 13th consecutive year that the Great American Bash has been broadcast to your home. Actually, it was the 8th. The first Bash pay-per-view was in 1988, although there were Great American Bash house shows starting with the Charlotte Baseball Stadium show on July 6, 1985, where Ric Flair vs. Nikita Koloff drew 27,000 fans. In both 1986 and 1987 there were Bash Summer Tours of Arenas, and the first Bash pay-per-view was headlined by Ric Flair vs. Lex Luger in 1988. However, there was no Great American Bash, as the name was dropped by WCW, in 1993 or 1994 stemming from debacles of shows under that name in 1991, among the worst pay-per-view shows ever, and 1992, and the name was brought back in 1995. 1. Ultimo Dragon, Yoshihiro Asai, defeated Sikosis, Dionisio Castellanos, in 1420. The storyline for this match was it was a battle of respect and the idea was that one wanted to beat the other via submission. It started slower than you'd think with Sikosis doing a lot of American heel tricks and going away from the lucha style. Dragon was over much bigger as a face than you'd think, with the fans popping huge for many of his spots, particularly his kicks and a move where he did basically a spinning torture rack and drop. Dragon missed a pescado onto the floor and Ono met him with a series of kicks on the floor. Sikosis draped Dragon's throat over the ropes outside the ring and leg dropped him off the top rope. Sikosis got a near fall with La Magistral the move Dragon has used to win several WCW matches. Dragon went to suplex Ono outside the ring after blocking his kick spot, but Sikosis came over the top rope to the floor to clobber him. Dragon used his trademark Asai moonsault and the in the ring hit the tombstone pile driver, which was described as being one of Sikosis' finishing moves, on him for a near fall. Lots of near falls at this point and it turned into a great match. One of the highlight spots was Dragon doing a somersault in the ring into a Frankensteiner in one spot, but Sikosis reversing the spot into a cradle for a near fall. Sikosis went for a moonsault block but Dragon got up and met him with a dropkick to the knee. Dragon went to the top rope for his Rana into a Urakan Rana finisher, and hit the move. He set for a tiger suplex, but Ano got on the apron. Dragon went after Ano and Sikosis hit him with a dropkick off the top rope to the back. Sikosis went to whip Dragon into an Ono kick, but Dragon reversed it and Sikosis got kicked. Dragon used the Dragon Sleeper for the tap out finish. 3 and 3 quarter stars. 2. Harlem Heat, Lane and Booker Huffman, beat Rick and Scott Steiner, Robert and Scott Reach Steiner, in 1202. About what you'd expect from these teams. Steiners did a lot of suplexes and clotheslines. Booker T did a few cool spots. In between it was so so. Mostly they got heat on Rick. Rick hot tagged to Scott, who for the first time in his career, hit a Frankensteiner off the top rope on T and had him pinned. At this point NWO Vincent hit the ring and kicked T, and the ref DQ'd the Steiners for outside interference, theoretically giving Heat the title shot at the Road Wild pay-per-view on August 9th, although on Nitro the next night it was announced a rematch between the two teams had been ordered for the June 23rd Nitro with the winner of that match getting the title shot. From a storyline standpoint, the story is that the NWO was trying to make sure that the Steiners didn't win the match and thus get the title shot. This finish is probably acceptable on a Nitro or a Saturday night show but came off as really lame and flat on a pay-per-view show. After the match the Steiners destroyed Vincent with a double clothesline and Rick bulldogged him off the top rope as he was on Scott's shoulders. Vincent's famed physique from his WWF years is no longer there. One and one half star. Three. Conan Charles Carlos Espada Ashinoff beat Hugh Morris, William DeMott, in 1034. They tried to do a lot of mat work but the crowd didn't get into it. Morris has good facials and is really agile for a guy of his size, but I've still never seen him have a great complete match. Conan twisted his knee legit taking a bump into the ring steps and from that point on the match fell apart. Finish saw Morris on the top rope for a moonsault and it took Conan forever to get up and sweep his legs for him to fall off the ropes. On the mat Conan used the tequila sunrise, which is a combination half crab and arm lock, for the submission. As Public Enemy was doing their interview which went nowhere on television and died live, Conan had to be helped out of the ring, which wasn't shown on TV because it would have taken from both a knee injury angle and the double stretcher job angle planned for later in the show. Negative one half star. 4. Glacier, Ray Lloyd, Beat Wrath, Brian Clark, in 1202. Mortis was handcuffed to the ring post for this match. They did lots of kicks and palm blows early. Glacier hit a pescado and threw Wrath into the steps. At one point Mortis pushed Wrath out of the way causing Glacier to crash into the corner. Wrath had Mortis high for a power bomb but dropped him backwards into a hot shot. 
Rath used a rolling body block off the apron which was kind of an impressive move for his size. They tried to build Rath at 6 foot 10 or 6 foot 11, more like 6 foot 6 or 6 foot 7. Even with all the trappings and throwing in some nice moves for a guy of his size, he still got the charisma of Adam Bomb and the match really never got over. Finish saw Mortis throw a chain into the ring but Glacier got it and hit Rath with it for the pin. As this was going on, James Vandenberg got the key to the handcuffs from the ref and released Mortis. The two handcuffed Glacier to the ring ropes, it took them two tries to pull that one off, and attacked him after the match. Three quarters of a star. 5. Akira Hokuto Hisako Uno, retained the WCW women's title beating Medusa, Deborah and Michelli, in 1141. This match was far more significant than just the stipulations that Medusa would have to retire since she's going to become a valet, if she lost. This result truly signified the death of women's wrestling in the United States once again. Sure, women's wrestling will continue to exist on the indie level, but WWF gave it up at the end of 1995 and hasn't looked back, and now WCW by this result has given it up as well. While both groups tried to make Medusa the standard bearer figuring her combination of some ability and sex appeal would be marketable. It didn't work in either federation. She didn't have breakthrough charisma, and more importantly, the only way gimmicks like women or minis can work in 1997 as any more than a once-a-year sideshow act is if they perform better than the men. On occasion Medusa and Bull Nakano in WWF were better than the man, but not consistently and eventually nobody cared, and once they did the Bertha Fay feud, everyone knew the division was dead. There were a lot of people who didn't understand the situation that put tons of heat on Medusa for the throwing the WWF belt in the garbage can when she showed up on Nitro, but that was what Eric Bischoff wanted and it got her a two-year contract with WCW when her opportunities and wrestling were limited. For reasons I've never figured out, a lot of people didn't understand that Medusa was fired by the WWF, well, technically, they decided to not renew her contract and drop women's wrestling altogether. Seeing his chance to pull a major in-your-face move, Bischoff made the deal with Medusa, and it was clear at the beginning the company had no idea what they were actually going to do with her after the belt in the garbage can once they got her. They tried bringing in a Japanese wrestling legend in Hokuto and give her a storyline, but it never got over, and the Americans that they tried to put her against got over even less and couldn't have good matches with her. The bottom line was business it cost too much to fly in opponents from Japan to feed her when they weren't going to have a great match and nobody cared about it anyway, and with the promoters perceiving that the male audience wanted to see T and A valets rather than women wrestle. But it is unfortunate that due to the lack of real talent available in the States, that it'll probably be many years before women's wrestling resurfaces in WWF or WCW, and you know anything presented with women before an ECW audience can be anything but a sideshow catfight. As for the match, it was the best one the two had thus far, with a good dramatic storyline and well-executed moves. At one point Medusa did a double sledge off the ropes and sold it as if her knee went out. Lee Marshall, who was the AWA television announcer in the late 80s, immediately brought up that Medusa had previously injured that leg against Wendy Richter, don't know if that's true as I don't remember it, but it was really clever booking. Hokuto worked the knee with a knee breaker and La Tapatia, Rito Romero special or upside down surfboard, before getting a near fall with a northern light suplex. Medusa came back with a high power bomb for a near fall. Hokuto used a superplex off the top rope for a near fall and went back with a great knee bar submission that went over the head of all three announcers, and Medusa struggled to the ropes. Hokuto missed a drop kick off the top rope. Medusa used a German suplex but Ana broke the bridge and further damaged the knee. Hokuto kept working on the knee and then climbed to the top rope with a splash, but Medusa got her knees up, which only further damaged the knee. Medusa got a clothesline for a near fall, but collapsed trying a suplex, and Hokuto scored the pin with her trademark Northern Lights bomb. Medusa sold the injury so well that when Jean Okerlund went to interview her, fans were chanting leave her alone at him. 3 stars. 6. Chris Benoit beat Mang Yu Yu Li Fifida, in 1459 of what was billed as a death match. Nancy Sullivan is no longer associated with Benoit although no acknowledgement was made of it and no storyline reason given. As best we can tell, it's just another example of Kevin Sullivan losing power. There has been talk of Nancy resurfacing in someone else's corner or just disappearing from the scene. Sullivan is still supposed to return to booking in August, theoretically after retiring from the ring after the next pay-per-view show, although that isn't as definite as people are saying, and if he does, his power as booker likely won't be what it was. This match had a basic storyline that Benoit kept going back to the crossface and Meng kept using his power to break it or get to the ropes until he finally wore him down and made him tap with it.
in that way the match had a good storyline, and obviously Benoit is one of the five best performers in the country. The negatives are Meng is very limited and fans at home don't respect Meng for his legit toughness the way those in the business do so it never registers to people who see him as a large, uncharismatic undercard guy who has been around forever and never done anything. The negative to the rules of this match is that they didn't do pins, but the match could end with a 10-count knockout. So instead of exciting near falls that build up excitement, whenever a hot move was hit they did 10 counts that the crowd didn't understand, and kept killing the momentum. Benoit did a great tope at the bell, immediately hit the diving headbutt and put and the crossface, but Meng powered out. A second crossface saw a rope break. Meng used a splash off the top but Benoit got up at 9. Benoit got two eight counts on Meng with German suplexes. Meng got the Tongan death grip on but Benoit escaped by falling outside the ring to the floor. All the momentum breaking from the 10 counts made the match get boring as it went so long. Benoit got the crossface twice more with rope breaks until finally getting it again and Meng not submitting and being inches from the ropes before he finally tapped out. The announcers didn't do a good job of getting the drama over as Meng being so close to he ropes yet so far, nor get the tap over. Actually they didn't see it until the replay. Both men went out on a stretcher after the match to sell its brutality, which was kind of silly because neither appeared to take any more than a usual beating. 2 and 1 quarter stars. 7. Kevin Green pinned Steve McMichael in 921. With the exception of people like Owen Hart, Hiroshi Hase and Jun Akiyama, all of whom had put in far more time training for pro wrestling, I don't know if I've ever seen such a natural from his third match as Green. Due to his age and the fact he's probably never going to be a full-time wrestler, he'll surely never be the wrestler the aforementioned three turned out to be, but he is amazing given he's only had a few weeks total of training time, this was only his third pro match, and McMichael is hardly the great worker that Ric Flair or Arnold Anderson were to carry him. They did a spot where McMichael started yelling at Green's mother, who then clocked him with her purse. Speaking of Green, has anyone ever found his wife? Remember, she disappeared last July at the bash and nobody has ever seen her since. I think she fell off the roof with the giant or something. This was a totally decent match ending when Jeff Jarrett came out to hit Green with the briefcase, but Green pulled McMichael into the path of the briefcase and McMichael got nailed and pinned. After the match Deborah was yelling at Jarrett for screwing up and the announcers were questioning why after Jarrett screwed up that he walked away without helping McMichael. Two stars. Eight. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall retained the WCW tag titles beating Ric Flair, Richard Fleer, and Roddy Piper, Roderick Toombs, in 10.02. Flair opened with a frenzied series of chops on Hall until he did his flip into the buckle, landed on the apron and ran into Nash's foot. After six tripped Flair from the outside, he took punishment for a few minutes. Match had great heat and everyone seemed to be on the same page after the problems from a week earlier. Of course, Piper is so washed up that even when he's on the page, he isn't exactly a speed reader anymore. Flair hit Nash with a low blow and hot tagged Piper. Piper got Hall in the sleeper, but with the ref occupied with Flair, Hall crotched Piper on the top rope. Six kicked Piper and went after Flair. Flair chased Six to the back and was never heard from again. They speculated that Flair was jumped by the NWO and he went backstage, but it was ridiculous that they went off the air without an explanation. This left Piper against both men and a situation like that is an easy heat getter and this was no different. Finally Piper was worn down and after a clothesline to the back from Hall and a big foot by Nash, Hall used the outsider's edge or NWO drop or razor's edge or splash mountain or whatever else you want to call it on him for the pin. The original plan for Flair and Piper to turn on each other at the finish was changed because the company felt too many people knew about it. In other words, they're back to that mentality that they'd rather surprise 1% of the people than do angles that they believe when they formulate them are the best thing for the other 99% when it comes to business. Luckily WCW is in a hot position where they can survive that kind of defeatist mentality in that they allow outside forces to change their storylines for them. They'll probably eventually do the angle anyway just because Flair and Piper don't have a program at this point unless it's with each other. 2 and 1 quarter stars. 9. Randy Savage, Randy Poffo, Pin Diamond Dallas Page, Page Falkenberg, in a Wild Falls Count Anywhere Lights Out match in 1656. A great smartly worked brawl. One thing watching this show is that when it comes to timing of when is the right point to do a move, that Page and Dragon are almost perfect. Page came through the crowd as everyone was distracted by Kimberly. He had his ribs taped from the Nitro angle and did a pescado but sold his own ribs. Later as Savage hid behind Elizabeth, Page simply threw Elizabeth aside. The two went up brawling through the crowd which included Page wearing out Savage with a crutch. 
they got back in the ring and Savage threw some leftover white powder from the 80s into Page's face and broke what appeared to be a plate over Page's head. Savage undid the bandages on Page's ribs and then decked and pile drove ref Mickey J. Mark Curtis came out and he was thrown out of the ring. Savage threw Page over the top rope and went after Kimberly. Before he could hit her, Nick Patrick ran out and got in his way. They ended up brawling back into a VIP picnic type area. Page broke a tray over Savage's head, hit him with a slower pot, slammed him through a picnic table and finally poured charcoal from a barbecue grill all over him. Back in the ring, Page crotched Savage on the post and gave him a face-first pile driver similar to a pedigree. Savage made a comeback whipping Page into the steps. Savage undid the mats on the floor and went for a pile driver, but Patrick stopped him. Savage punched Patrick. The two traded a chair shot and a low blow before Page finally hit the diamond cutter with no ref to count. Hall ran out and stomped on Patrick. Page began fighting off Hall until Savage grabbed the tag team title belt and clocked Page with it from behind and Hall dropped him with the edge. Savage climbed to the top rope and hit the elbow and Hall dragged Patrick over to count the fall. The show immediately went off the air after the pinfall as it appeared this match went long as they were working on borrowed time. Three and three quarter stars. After a few false starts, the first Triple Mania, the showcase series of events from AAA in Mexico, took place under rather uneventful conditions at the Plaza de Toros in Tijuana on June 13. The dates of the usual three-card series had been repeatedly changed over the past few weeks, and the series was scheduled to begin on June 8 in Juarez with a Latin lover versus Crazy 33 hair versus hair match inside a cage. For reasons unclear, having to do with not getting the correct permits, the show never took place, making Tijuana the start. The Tijuana show was described as being unlike any triple mania to date and easily the worst in the five-year history of the major show which debuted in 1993. The atmosphere wasn't there. The show didn't appear much different than any other house show, and television cameras weren't taping the event. All these point to the problems with the AAA promotion that has really fallen apart at the seams over the past year plus. The show drew about 6,000 fans in the outdoor stadium headlined by Pero Ogueo and T. Nieblas Jr. and Connect beating Jake Roberts and Gorgeous George, Rob Kellum, who worked USWA last year as Gorgeous George III, and The Killer, a Mexican wrestler who does an American from New York City gimmick, in two straight disqualification falls. This match was said to have been no worse than you'd think but also no better. Roberts didn't get anywhere the level of heat that Razor Ramon and Diesel, as in Rick Bogner and Glenn Jacobs, got in their previous matches in Tijuana. In other results, Colin won. Local wrestlers Firebird and Forestero and Black Silver beat Depredator and Syndrome and Caligula. 2. In easily the best match on the show, described as being three and one half stars, the Space Cadets, Venom and Luxor and Discovery and Supernova, beat the Gangsters, Frank Nitti and Goyo and Al Capone, and Loco Valentino in two out of three falls when Venom pinned Capone in the third fall. All kinds of great flying moves in this match. 3. In a minis match, La Parquita and Octagon Cheeto and a third wrestler whose name was never made clear but appeared to be a very small local wrestler who usually doesn't work as a mini, won two out of three falls from Mini Pentagon and Mini Mankind and Mini Goldust. Both Mascara de Sagrada Jr. and Mini Vader no show the card since they've jumped to promo Azteca, so this wasn't the quality of the minis matches that have been on television of late. It was still a good match in the three stars range. 4. Pentagon and Fuerza Guerrera and Sandre Chicana beat Octagon and Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Arandu in two out three falls. Arandu subbed for La Parca Jr. who was announced as having been in an auto accident earlier in the week. This was a really bad match, 5. In a street fight, which consisted of mainly really weak punches back and forth and four chair shots, Cybernetico beat Pierre Roth Jr. in just 7.30, 6. In a four corners tag match, known in Mexico as Relevos T1 Aces, a phrase that Antonio Pena has trademarked, in which the ultimate loser would lose his hair, it wound up with heavy metal and local wrestler Leon Negro winning over Latin lover and Pero Aguayo Jr., Jerry Estrada and Picudo and My Flowers and Alcone Dorado Jr. Dorado Jr. was a sub for Crazy 33, who didn't appear. The match was originally not scheduled as a hair match, but when the Juarez show was cancelled and Crazy 33 didn't lose his hair there, that stipulation was added for Crazy 33 to lose here. So he no-showed, and my flowers ended up getting his head shaved after Negro pinned him in the finals. This was described as a three stars match as well. Japanese Television Rundown May 25th All Japan, 1.
Sabu and Rob Van Dam beat Kentaro Shiga and Yoshinari Ogawa in 1340 when Van Dam pinned Shiga after a split leg moonsault, which in Japan is called the Hollywood Press. About the last seven minutes aired. Van Dam was in most of the way, so it was solid and good work. Sabu was hardly in, but didn't look good at all except for one leap off a chair into a springboard double sledge on the floor. Two and three quarter stars. Two. Gary Albright and Bobby Duncombe Jr. beat Tamon Honda and Giant Kimala 2 in 11.27, when Albright pinned Honda after two German suplexes. Only the last three minutes aired, but what aired was okay, three. The Patriot and Kenna Kobashi and Johnny Ace beat Toshiaki Kaoda and Akira Tao and Takao Mori on 20.21. More than 15 minutes aired on television, and it was a real disappointment considering the talent involved. It was never good except for a few flurries with Kobashi vs. Kaoda. Ace had one of those matches where he was off on most everything. He's also cut his hair short, I guess to look more like a serious headliner now that he's getting the biggest push of his career, and less like a pretty boy. But he's on top more due to attrition and just surviving for a long period of time. Patriot didn't look bad, but Amori did. Amori got a bloody nose after being dropped on his head by Kobashi. Patriot ended up pinning Amori with a power bomb. Two stars. May 25th All Japan Women 1. Momoe Nakanishi pinned Yuko Kasugi of JD to retain the All Japan Junior title in 935 after a body slam. Only 330 aired. Both are 16 years old. It's really scary to watch the show and see the graphics listing both as being born in late 1980. Nakanishi is really green but looks to be a really good athlete with potential. Can't say the same for Kasugi. 2. Asia Kong and Bison Kimura beat Takako Inoue and Yumiko Hata in 23-12 when Kong pinned Hata after the Eureka backhand spin punch. Finishing move was wicked. Crowd in Nagoya was listed as 4,750 but it was closer to half that, and for the most part like most AJW crowds this year, they didn't react much. They finally got the crowd into the match but ended up losing them. Some stiff work, particularly the kicks by Hata and Kong. Lots of spots didn't hurt just right but it was a fast-paced match with a lot of good moves and near falls. Three and a quarter stars. Three. Manami Toyota and Tashio Yamada won a non-title match over WWWA tag champs Tomoko Watanabe and Kumiko Makawa in 1848. About 10.30 aired on television. Toyota was really good as usual, but toned down from her days as the superstar of the promotion. She did one moonsault and a springboard somersault plancha, although she almost fell off the ropes in the ladder. Rest was basic stuff. Pretty good work but hurt by the lack of heat. Three and one half stars. Four. Kyoko Inoue went to a 60 minutes draw with Kaoru Ito in the match which ended with Inoue vacating the triple crown because she didn't score a pinfall. About 24 minutes aired on television. It was a very good match, but based on television, which is often misleading, didn't appear to be a great match. It was never slow but never really heated or that exciting until the end. One highlight early was Ito doing a series of double foot stomps, including one off a table outside the ring, one off the top rope to the floor and three more off the top rope inside the ring, but still failed to get the pin. The last minute saw Inoue hit three German suplexes and the Niagara driver for a near fall which got a good pop. Don't want to rate the match because so much of it didn't air but it appeared in the three and one half stars range. May 31st, New Japan. 1. Tatsuhiro Takaiwa pinned Dr. Wagner Jr. in 9.53 after a Death Valley bomb and his triple power bomb in a row. The last four minutes aired on television. Two and a half stars. 2. Shinjiro Otani pinned Hanzo Nakajima in 12.26, five minutes aired, with his swan dive, springboard drop kick to the back, and dragon suplex. Good near falls but kind of slow paced at the end. Depending upon what they did early, the editing may have given a deceptive idea of the quality of the match. Three and a quarter stars. Three. El Samurai pinned Yoshihiro Tajiri in 1342, seven minutes aired. This was a great match. Tajiri did a running flip dive to the floor, and a leg rolling cradle for a near fall. Tajiri really looked hot doing reversals of Samurai spots. Finally Samurai hit his reverse implant and scored the pin. Three and three quarter stars. Four. Manabu Nakanishi and Satoshi Kojima beat Tatsutoshi Goto and Akira Nagami in 11.33, 6 minutes aired, when Nakanishi made Nagami submit to the Argentinian backbreaker. Two and a half stars. 
5. Kejimuto and Riki Choshu beat Shiro Koshinaka and Mishiyoshi Ohara in 9.30 when Choshu pinned Ohara after a lariat. Muto wasn't bad but finish came with no build and easily the weakest match on the show. 1 and 1 quarter stars. 6. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and NWO Sting beat Shinya Hashimoto and Kensuke Sasaki and Takashi Izuka in 12.57, 8 minutes aired. This was a surprisingly good match, largely because Tenzan worked most of the way for his side. The losing team all looked good and really even NWO Sting looked okay. Finally Izuka got caught with a stuffed powerbomb, then Sting lariated him off the top and Tenzan gave him a headbutt off the top for the pin. Three and a quarter stars. June 1st All Japan 1. Kobashi and Ace won the double tag team titles from Kawada and Tao in 2840. The last 12 minutes aired on television and it was a match of the year candidate, and that's even with poor production and voiceovers obviously done in studios which muffle the crowd heat. It was one of those matches that only All Japan has that are super stiff, with twists and turns, just about perfect psychology, hot pacing, great near falls and the execution was there as well and in this case an upset tag title change to boot. Kobashi was the star of the match here being in there most of the way, but Ace and Tao were both having great nights as well. Finish saw Tao go for the choke slam, but Kobashi blocked it, then Tao took Kobashi down with a foot sweep. But Kobashi got back up and hit a solid lariat for the pin. In unedited form with better production, this may have been the best tag team match of the year. Four and three quarter stars. Two. Mitsuharu Misawa and Kobashi and Shiga beat Steve Williams and Richard Slinger in the lacrosse in 1954, 10 minutes aired. This turned into an excellent match as well, particularly the work with Shiga against Slinger. Slinger got lots of near falls on Shiga, who the crowd really gets into because he's small but has great fire. Kobashi wound up pinning Slinger with a suplex dropped into a power bomb. Four stars. June 7th, New Japan. In the open, they aired the clip from Nitro where Great Muda turned NWO in the match with Masahiro Chono. It looked even more ridiculous watching it from a Japanese sports context than it did watching it live. 1. Tenzan and Hiro Saito and NWO Sting beat Junji Hirata and Choshu and Sasaki in 10.09, last 6 minutes aired, when Sting pinned Hirata with a clothesline off the top rope. 1 and 1 half star. 2. Ian Dean pinned Jushin Liger in 11.57, last 6 minutes aired, by reversing an attempt at an Oklahoma side roll and ending with a cradle. This was the same finish as in the Steve Regal Prince Aokia pay per view match earlier this year. Liger looked good and Dean didn't make any mistakes, but didn't show anything out of the ordinary either. 3 stars. 3. Chris Jericho pinned Samurai in 15.17, last 7 minutes aired. Basically, real good with lots of good near falls and reverses. At one point, Jericho went for his springboard off the middle rope over the top rope to the floor crossbody, and Samurai was so far out of position that the move looked ridiculous. Samurai hit a tope and followed in the ring with his reverse DDT and a Samurai, Onita's Thunder Fire Power, bomb. Lots of great spots. They were both standing on the top rope for the finish when both lost their balance and tumbled to the floor. It became obvious it was a blown spot when they got back in the ring and back into the same position, and this time Jericho hit the Super Frankensteiner for the pin. Three and one half stars. Four. Koji Kanemoto beat Grand Naniwa in 1453, nine minutes aired. Kanemoto did a tremendous job here showing he's one of the best workers in the business. He kicked the hell out of Naniwa and showed a lot of arrogance and attitude in the process. He ripped up Naniwa. Mask and finally took it all the way off and threw it into the crowd. This turned into a great match with all kinds of near falls ending when Kanemoto hit a tiger suplex and used a cross arm breaker for the submission. 4 stars. 5. Hashimoto and Tadao Yasuda beat Koshinaka and Tatsutoshi Goto in 11.25, 7 minutes aired, when Hashimoto pinned Gogo, with a brain buster. Yasuda got some pretty good heat for his trademark offense of sumo thrusts and a double arm suplex, and for kicking out of Koshinaka's big moves. Two and one quarter stars. June 8th All Japan 1. Misawa pinned Kawada in 3122 to retain the Triple Crown. The final 2130 aired on television. It lived up to its billing and was from a pure psychological standpoint, perhaps the best match I've ever seen. It was slow-paced. But talk about making every move mean something. They haven't had as many meetings. 
that these two as a rivalry is every bit as important historically and from a match quality standpoint as the 90s version of Funk Brisco in the 70s or Flair Steamboat in the 80s. Just physically brutal, superheat and intensity and each man took incredible punishment, including multiple drops on their heads. Anyway this is one match worth searching out and at this point I'd have to rate it ahead of both Misawa Kobashi bouts or the Mania Heart Austin as the match of the year. To someone who has never seen the two wrestle before, the Misawa Kobashi may be a better match than this one, because in this match they played so much off blocking their well-known spots so to a regular All Japan viewer, this would be a better match than the Kobashi match, but to a viewer unfamiliar with their previous bouts, the Kobashi match would be the better match. 5 stars plus Puerto Rico the Carlos Colon Chiqui star loser leaves town for one year match drew an estimated 3,200 fans on June 7th, in Bayamon ending with Colon winning with a small package in 1028. Star apparently was having problems at his real job of being a professional bodyguard and decided to take some time off wrestling. Also on the show Invader No. 1 beat Sean Morley using the heart punch as a finisher. The gimmick was that Invader No. 1 would get to tape his fist. On television, Hill manager Rico Suave came out with a contract saying that if Morley lost, that Suave would kiss Invader No. 1's feet at the end of the match. Invader signed the contract immediately and Suave started laughing saying Invader was an idiot to sign without reading it, because there was a clause where Morley would be able to wear a bulletproof vest, thus making the heart punch useless, during the match. For the finish, Invader removed the vest and used the heart punch and in the storyline they are saying Morley was badly injured and would be out of action for months. Actually Morley returned this week to EMLL where he wrestles as Steel and is currently the world heavyweight champion there. In the other key matches, Mohamed Hussein retained the Puerto Rican title losing via DQ to Ray Gonzalez, Ricky Santana and La Ale retained the WWC tag titles beating Huracan Castillo and Great Sensei via DQ and Pablo Marquez won the American lightweight title from Chuck Singer. Greg Valentine and Ram Man were both no-shows as Ram Man has quit the promotion over money. Justin St. John was fired on May 30th while Ram Man and Alex G left over money problems. Several of the foreign wrestlers are way behind on being paid and others are on the verge of leaving as well for that reason. Headed in over this past weekend were Invader No. 2, veteran Roberto Soto Golden Boy. Hopefully not Sheik Donovan, P. formerly Tahitian warrior Lloyd Anoya, Kuhio, another Samoan, as a tag team called the Islanders and Abdullah the Butcher, who headlined the June 14th show in Humacao against Cologne. They are holding a tournament on television for the vacant Universal title. Savio Vega's WWA has officially closed down, but he's looking for a new television station and appears to have a new backer if he gets it to reopen. EMLL EMLL has sold Pista Arena Revolucion where it used to run two or three shows per week. There was a big stink made about in the newspaper saying how they would be putting dozens of wrestlers and vendors out of work. The June 13th Arena Mexico main event saw El Hijo del Santo and Scorpio Jr. and Dr. Wagner Jr. beat Negro Casas and Ultimo Dragon and La Fiera. Felino did an interview on the show and claimed that it wasn't him, as Santo said on television last week, who gave Santo the power bomb off the middle ropes in the Dragon costume, but that it was Dragon, which it wasn't. To get the angle over, in the second fall, Dragon used the power bomb off the middle ropes to pin Santo, showing that he could do it. Final fall saw Bestia Salvaje who was at ringside the entire match, distract Casas causing him to be pinned. CMLL heavyweight champ Steel, John Morley, returned on June 10th at Arena Coliseo beating with El Satanico and Emilio Charles Jr. to beat Takamichi Noku and El Texano in Shocker, and three days at Arena Mexico who teamed with Kevin Quinn from Chicago and Apollo Dantes to lose via DQ against Lismark and Atlantis and Mr. Niebla. Promo Azteca the major show of the week was June 13th in Xochimilco headlined by Los Villanos vs. Los Hermanos Dinamita and a Mexican national welterweight title match with Salcero dropping the belt to Nigma. The biggest show this coming week is June 20th in Cuernavaca with Conan and Hector Garza and Mascara Sagrada vs. Cien Caras and Dandy and Blue Panther. Super Parca, formerly Volador in AAA, debuts on that show as will Mini Rey Mysterio Jr., who was Mascara de Sagrada Jr. in AAA and WWF, and Espectrito, who was working as Mini Vader. They have a major show on June 29th in Tijuana which will be taped as part of a WCW special on Mexican wrestling with Conan and Garza and Lismark Jr. and Parker vs. Damien and Silver King and Psicosis and Juventud Guerrera on top plus El Ejo del Santo, Felino and Rey Mysterio Jr. appearing as well. AAA 
AAA. You know things must be bad when a Spectro who is Antonio Pena's nephew, quit the promotion to join Grupo Revolucion, which is a small group running in the Distrito Federal. Abismo Negro has turned babyface. Expect another slew of wrestlers to jump within the next six weeks. Japan. A slow week with neither All Japan or New Japan running. The biggest show of the week was All Japan Women running June 17th and June 18th at Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center. On the first night they drew and announced 3,200, which indicates probably a poor crowd realistically, with Kyoko Inoue winning back the vacant WWWA title beating Kaoru Ito in 26.01 with the Niagara Driver in a rematch of their 60 minutes draw on March 31st, in a battle of former tag champs Atsuko Mita and Mima Shimoda, who are getting the big push now as a heel team, beat Manami Toyota and Tashio Yamada in 22.10. Mita and Shimoda get a shot at Kumiko Makawa and Tomoko Watanabe's WWWA tag titles on June 18th. In addition, Mariko Yoshida retained the CMLL women's title pinning Ri Tamata. Inichiro Tenryu held a press conference this past week to announce his July 6 show at Tokyo Sumo Hall which commemorates both the 20th anniversary of his pro wrestling debut and the 5th anniversary of the war promotion. The lineup is a major disappointment as Tenryu's attempts to get Toshiaki Kawada in as his opponent failed. Bouts announced were Tenryu vs. Tarzan Goto, a match to create new war six-man tag team champions with Koki Kitahara and Nobutaka Arai and Lance Storm vs. Tommy Dreamer and Koji Kiao and Nobukazu Hirai, Yuji Yasuriyoka defending the international junior title against Masao Orihara, Yoshiaki Fujiwara vs. Abdullah the Butcher, an interpromotional war vs. Ishikawa Iga match with Arashi and Osamu Tashiakari vs. Takashi Ishikawa and Shigeo Okamura and an LLPW match with Rumi Kazama and Michiko Amukai vs. Evil Soai and Sorio Kino. New Japan won't be able to help Tenryu since it's running a major show in Sapporo the same night. Originally they had announced Dory Funk and were negotiating to bring in five wrestlers from ECW. Dreamer being on the show is interesting politically since Dreamer shot an angle in ECW for FMW with Terry Funk and Wing Kanemura, and now he's working for war although the plans still are for him to work later this year for FMW. Taz and Chris Condito may go to war in August. Rings on June 21st at Tokyo Ariaki Coliseum has the two Valley Tudo matches with Ricardo Moraes vs. Yuri Kordikin of Russia and Adilson Lima vs. Alexander Pyotrov of Russia, both matches having Akira Maeda as referee. The rest of the show has Kiyoshi Tamura vs. Grom Zaza, Yoshihise Yamamoto vs. Maurice Smith, which will be a shoot match, Mitsuya Nagai vs. Andre Manart, Masayuki Naruse vs. Leo Hasdell and Suyashi Kosaka vs. Yuri Bekshev. Pankrace on June 30th at Hakata Star Lanes has Yuki Kondo vs. Sami Schult, Masakatsu Fanaki vs. Wesley Gassaway, Boss Rutan vs. Takaku Fuk, Guy Mesger vs. Keiichiro Yamamiya, Asami Shibuya vs. Brian Gassaway and Satoshi Hasegawa vs. Alex Andrade. At this point it appears that Ken Shamrock will face Vader on FMW September 28th Kawasaki Baseball Stadium show. The deal wasn't finalized as of our last report, but that was where the negotiations were headed. The feeling from Atsushi Onita and others is that Gregory Verichev, the Soviet Olympic judo player, had been gone from Japan for so long his name would mean nothing and a match with Shamrock wouldn't sell enough tickets to justify bringing Shamrock over. They spoke with Kimo, but he wanted about $150,000 to put Shamrock over it, and it was out of their price range. Bam Bam Bigelow would have done it for less, but the holdup was that when Bigelow was told the match was going to be taped on a Sunday for airing the next day on Raw, he didn't want it to appear on Raw doing the job. Onita believes this is the year FMW can overtake All Japan as the number two wrestling promotion in Japan which is why he's trying to work with WWF and ECW with interpromotional feud type matches. Onita wants to bring five or six WWF stars to Japan for both November and December and do Japanese angles with them although this is all at this point in the planning stages. They're going to do a second baseball stadium show, now in December, which as the current plans are, would consist of five WWF matches including a Shamrock vs. Vader rematch as the main event, which likely means they'll split their two matches, and a Terry Funk and Dreamer vs. Onita and Wing Kanemura explosive barbed wire bomb match, an ECW heavyweight title match, an ECW tag team title match and several FMW matches with WWF and ECW both being partners in the show. FMW announced a show for August 2nd in Tokyo at the Shia Dome with an explosive barbed wire match between Wing Kanemura vs. Masato Tanaka with the winner getting the singles match with Onita at Kawasaki Stadium. We've also heard Onita may turn heel on this show a la Hogan and Bret Hart and set up a tag team match for the stadium main event. Nikon Sports reported that the original Mr. Pogo, 
who retired last year, would return to wrestling for the Big Japan promotion on July 23 at Karakuen Hall against Shinya Kojika. Former magazine writer Miki Ibaragi's latest incarnation of the Wings promotion called Shinsei Wings debuts on June 27 in Narada. The only names announced were the original Jason the Terrible and Mexican women's wrestler Neftali. Hiramichi Fuyuki's Fuyuki Gun promotion ran on June 12 in Kyoto with Fuyuki and Ghetto and Jado keeping the FMW's World Street Fight six man titles beating Black Hayabusa, don't know who he is, and the Headhunters. After the match, women wrestlers Linus Asuka and Shark Tsuchiya hit the ring and attacked Fuyuki. Asuka hit Fuyuki with his own title belt, knocking him down. This sets up shows on July 21st in Hakata where Fuyuki and Geto and Jado will defend their titles against Head Hunters and Tsuchiya, and July 22nd in Nagasaki with a singles match with Fuyuki vs. Asuka. The latter match would be the first man vs. woman singles match that I can ever recall in Japan, and certainly the first involving name wrestlers. Kingdom announced its next two dates after June 20th as being July 29th at the Tokyo Yoyogi Gym and September 16th in Kagoshima. That seems to indicate that the August 15th Tokyo Dome show has officially fallen apart as we had figured for a while. Antonio Inoki is going to appear at Kingdom's June 20th show so he and Nobuiko Takata will discuss some sort of a booking battle plan to work together once again. JWP held the second part of its Devil Masami 20th year anniversary on June 15th at Karakuen Hall as Masami and Jaguar Yokota reformed their tag team for the first time in 13 years beating Dynamite Kansai and Kanda Yakutsu. Yokota was Masami's original wrestling trainer even though both are the same age, 35. Chihiro Mikano, 19, was fired by Gia. No reasons were made public other than she broke a company rule. The June 8th All Japan Television show with the Misawa vs. Kaota match only drew a 2.7 rating which is below the weekly average that for the biggest match of the year. USWA The Return to Memphis on June 14th at the Big One Flea Market drew about 560 fans and $2,800 for the Jerry Lawler vs. Tommy Dreamer match to start the USWA vs. ECW feud here. Dreamer was at the live television show that morning and they had security guards protecting announcers Lance Russell and Michael St. John because they portrayed Dreamer as an out-of-control madman. There were several fans wearing ECW t-shirts at the studio and chants of ECW throughout television. While on one hand the promotion was happy that people knew about ECW, there were feelings hurt about how popular ECW was and that the crowd didn't take to ECW as a heel promotion as they did during the SMW feud. Dreamer first showed up trying to attack Lawler as he had a TV match against his cousin, Mr. Wrestling, Carl Fergie, however the security held back Dreamer and threw him out of the building. Finally late in the show, Dreamer broke through security and beat up USWA Commissioner Elliot Pollock and pretty well destroyed the television set, threw bleachers and a garbage can in the ring and while this was going on, the fans were cheering Dreamer like crazy. He also attacked the two security guards who sold the attack poorly. This led to the house show later that afternoon where Lawler and Dreamer went to a no contest. There were a lot of fans with ECW t-shirts, but in reality the crowd wasn't helped much by Dreamer being there as they'd been drawing about 500 fans to recent Saturday afternoon house shows, weeknight house shows at the big one were drawing closer to 250, and hadn't run in six weeks. There were chants of both ECW and ECW sucks. Dreamer came out shaking fans' hands and got a babyface reaction, and didn't play heel at all during the match. Lawler also played face and was cheered more than Dreamer during the match. This feud will be continuing although not sure in what fashion. Paul Heyman was said to be coming in for the next house show although with it scheduled for June 28th, that won't be the case because it's the same day as the ECW arena. Billy Travis won the USWA title from Brian Christopher at the show, while the USWA tag title wound up being held up. Flash Flanagan and Nick Dinsmore apparently won the belts beating Tank and Recon of the Truth Commission, but Pollock ruled that since the tag champs were Recon and an interrogator, that he was going to hold the titles up. Stephen Dunn, Mabel Spellbinder and Downtown Bruno are all gone. Dunn was fired stemming from an incident on June 13th with General Manager Larry Burton. In an attempt to draw a more hardcore audience, they ran a 10 p.m. bar show in the Memphis area, but it only drew 80 fans. They passed out squirt guns for the ringside fans, and Burton himself was having fun at ringside with the squirt guns. Dunn was furious after his match since Burton was squirting at him big time. Dunn said he's got a surgically repaired knee and felt Burton didn't respect wrestling, and they got into an argument which wound up with Dunn fired. The next morning at TV, Burton got into an actual mini-fight with Bruno when Bruno slapped Burton because he thought Burton owed him a $50 payoff. Spellbinder was apparently fired because he had words in the dressing room with Mike Samples. 
They show the same Vince McMahon interview from last week where he played Hill knocking Lawler, Razor Ramon and the Memphis wrestling fans. They did an angle on television where manager Luther Biggs was arguing with Christopher. Travis had hidden under the ring and came out and clocked Christopher in the ankle with his guitar to give him the injury that led to his dropping the title. Southern California prelim wrestler Cincinnati Red was in as a jobber for Christopher. Bulldog Scott Reigns, a newcomer here, used to wrestle Georgia Indies as Bo La, do. 69-year-old Gypsy Joe put over Dutch Mantel, now billing himself as the icon, around the house show circuit this week. Some of the USWA wrestlers were laughing at Dreamer, a lifelong wrestling fan and calling him a mark because when he came to television, he wanted to get his photo taken with Russell and Mantle. Dreamer was scheduled to wrestle Lawler again on June 17th in Louisville. Here and there. Former wrestler Stan Lane was recently on ESPN2 doing the television announcing of speedboat racing. Jim Helwig appeared at the licensing fair in New York this past week pushing his Ultimate Warrior comic books. He said that under no circumstances would he ever return to pro wrestling. Mr. Hughes has lost a ton of weight since he disappeared from his very brief WWF stint as he worked a Greg Price indie show on June 14th in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. Former ECW valet Kimono worked that show as the manager of the Ringlords in a match against the Rock and Roll Express. Northern States Wrestling Alliance debuts on July 11th in Westland, Michigan at the Wayne Ford Civic League. Upcoming Cauliflower Alley Club events are the 1997 East Coast Reunion at the Jetport in Elizabeth, New Jersey and March 14, 1998 at the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City, California with a toast and roast of Luthez. Empire Wrestling Federation runs July 6 in San Bernardino, California at the Boys and Girls Club. Ultimate Championship Wrestling runs June 28 at the Secret Cove Bar and Grill in Woodlawn, Va with Ricky Morton, Nikolai Volkov, Ivan and Vladimir Koloff and June 29 at Bumper Sports Grill in Fredericksburg, Virginia. George Steele appears June 21 in Summersworth, New Hampshire for Atlantic Wrestling Federation. For those interested in wrestling history, Steve Yohei of 660S Taylor Avenue, Montebello, California 90640 has gotten photocopies of the 1913 bio on Frank Gotch and the 1937 book The Fall Guys by Marcus Griffin for $30 each. If you've never heard of it, Fall Guys is generally considered the best and most accurate book ever written about pro wrestling, at least prior to the Luthez autobiography. Rock and Roll Express will appear for Texas All-Star Wrestling on August 2nd in Humble, Texas. NHB. A major NHB show was held on June 15th in Sao Paulo, Brazil featuring two tournaments and a superfight. In the superfight Carlos Barreto of Brazil, who is ranked in the top five in the world in most of the NHB newsletters and generally now considered as along with Marco who is being the best Brazilian heavyweight, increased his record to 7-0 with a tap-out victory over Paul Verlins, 6-6. Six six. It looks as though Barreto, who debuted in the US on the Mars pay-per-view show last November, will be in the July 27 UFC heavyweight tournament as the co-favorite with Mark Kerr, 3-0. The four-man heavyweight tournament came down to two well-known American wrestlers, national 1997 super heavyweight freestyle champion Tom Erickson and Kevin Randleman, a former two-time NCAA champion at Ohio State, both of whom close friends of Mark Coleman. Erickson increased his record to 5-0-1, and his only draw would have been a win had there been judges, by soundly beating Randleman, 6-2, to the point the much smaller Randleman was hospitalized after the match. Erickson punched Randleman out and apparently was trying to prove to his critics who weren't impressed by his Mars performance that he could use his fists. Randleman was scheduled to cut weight down from about 230 to under 200 for the UFC lightweight tournament on July 27, but at press time we don't know how badly injured he was and whether he'll be ready for that show. Semaphore Entertainment Group officials said that if Randleman suffered a concussion in Brazil, that they wouldn't use him on the upcoming show, similar to boxing guidelines, about a guy having to stay out 90 days after a knockout. Tito Ortiz is also doubtful for July 27th which would be his last chance for a while in UFC because he starts college wrestling at Cal State Bakersfield in September. Kevin Jackson is being talked with about doing the under 200 tournament although there is no deal set. Jerry Bullender was asked about the show but he said he only wants to do singles fights rather than tournaments at this point since he was originally told his tournament win would put him into a singles fight to crown the first under 200 champion of UFC. Also at the Brazil show, former Olympic Greco-Roman wrestler at 180 pounds and 1997 national champion, at 187, Dan Henderson, who I believe placed 7th in the 1996 Olympics, cut down to 176 and won the light heavyweight tournament beating Eric Smith with a choke. 
John Peretti's new submission wrestling and no striking promotion tentatively scheduled for an October debut on pay-per-view is going to be called International Wrestling Forum. Both request and viewer's choice have okayed carrying the event since striking is banned. A correction from last week when talking about the rule changes in UFC, we had reported that no UFC match had contained breaking of the fingers or the toes, but actually in the very first UFC, Patrick Smith was attempting to rip up the toes of Ken Shamrock. Right now the plan for the September 19th UFC is to be held somewhere in Russia. The working idea from Semaphore Entertainment Group's standpoint is to put together a Vitor Belfort vs. Don Fry main event. Fry hasn't signed his deal with New Japan although it's expected that he will. The idea that the December pay-per-view would have a Coleman Smith winner defend the title against the Belfort Fry winner, which naturally everyone is expecting would be the Coleman Belfort matchup. It appears the May 30th UFC did about in 0.4 by rate, which is along the lines of what all the shows have been doing since last September, although with a much smaller total universe than ever due to TCI pulling out. That would be approximately 80,000 buys and a $702,000 gross. UFC claims the July 27th show, which will also have request pulling out, will be available in 17 million homes but other sources figure with all the pullouts that the number could be quite a bit lower. There has been no cable reaction up to this point regarding the planned rule changes as far as companies reversing their positions, which have not been officially announced, but will be before you read this as they are doing a press conference on June 19th and go into effect on the July 27th show. Another change we didn't list last week is that they've added an under 160-pound weight division, although at this point it's a moot rule change, as many of them are in reality, since there are no plans for any matches of fighters in that weight classification. Sometime pro wrestler and NHB fighter Geza Coleman Jr. was injured in a street fight after being run over with a car. Coleman was working as a bouncer at a strip club when two patrons started a fight with him and he ran them off. As he went outside, they drove over him in their car. He suffered from road rash and needed 18 stitches as the car window smashed his elbow, but he's expected to be back fighting in July. ECW basically an ordinary weekend with house shows on June 13th in Allentown, Pennsylvania drawing about 900 and June 14th in Warwick, Pennsylvania drawing about 350. Both shows were largely well received as the fans are there for the brawling and it's largely what they get. Both main events had Sabu and Rob Van Dam over Taz and Chris Condito. The first night Taz was suffering from a shoulder injury and didn't do any of his suplexes. He ended up being handcuffed to the ropes but Todd Gordon came out with the key to release him. Bill Alfonso threw powder in Taz's eyes, and since he couldn't see, he ended up choking out Condito. The next night Sabu leg-dropped Gordon through a table and Taz ended up choking out the damage control women, which got a surprisingly little crowd reaction as usually the easiest and biggest pop in ECW is to beat up a woman. Rick Root appeared at both shows doing deals with Francine which led to Shane Douglas and Francine Heat. Bam Bam Bigelow was advertised for both shows but didn't appear and there were some complaints about that. Both weekend shows were also scheduled to have Tommy Dreamer vs. Louis Spicoli matches which didn't happen. On June 13th, Spicoli got sick and missed the show and Dreamer instead worked with Douglas, with Douglas winning due to interference from Van Dam. On June 14th, Dreamer didn't get back from Memphis in time, and although Spicoli was there, Heyman wasn't going to have him work the show. Eliminators kept the tag titles both nights basically in handicap matches with Cronus beating the FBI. Perry Saturn has his knee surgery on June 10th and it was considered successful. The doctor's prognosis was he'd be able to return to wrestling in 8 to 12 months. He still came to the ring and did some spots outside the ring. PG-13 put over Spike Dudley and Mikey Whipwreck and Pitbulls and got a lot of heat saying they're from the South. No word if Jerry Lawler will appear on the June 28th show but the plan right now is for him to face Dreamer on the August 17th pay-per-view show and to work a few house shows up to that point. Terry Funk is only working a few dates before the pay-per-view show hopefully to let him heal up by that time. Bobby Duncombe Jr. returned and Heyman figures to put him in Brian Lee's role. He's certainly an improvement. Duncombe was said to have looked good both nights doing a brawling style. This past week's television The Taz Show was the best TV in a long time. Dreamer vs. Raven for the final time had a lot of heat for the near falls. Actually nearly every near fall was a DDT but the crowd popped big for the kickouts. At the same time, even though this was about as good a match as the two could have, Raven didn't exactly look up to WCW caliber when it comes to what he did in the ring. The angle with Lawler was great. Taz vs. Sabu was a good match as Sabu hit most of his spots. The finish actually saw Taz pin himself by laying on his back to choke Sabu out. Then they aired the Taz TV title win over Douglas, 
which was dramatic for what it was in a three-minute challenge. The finish was basically the same as Benoit vs. Meng on the Great American Bash pay-per-view, but it was sold better in this situation. WCW Matches thus far announced for the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view on July 13th in Daytona Beach are Hulk Hogan and Dennis Rodman vs. Lex Luger and the Giant, Diamond Dallas Page and a mystery partner, who won't be Sting, vs. Scott Hall and Randy Savage, Kevin Sullivan vs. Chris Benoit in a loser-must-retire match and Jeff Jarrett defending the U.S. title against Steve McMichael. Originally there was to be a Ric Flair vs. Roddy Piper match but that may not take place due to reasons listed earlier although I expect still that it will. Nitro drew about 16,500 fans, 13,953 paying $218,285, on June 16th at the United Center in Chicago which was a few hundred shy of the sellout crowd they had for Nitro in the same building in January. The live gate was one of the largest in the history of the company but fell short of last week's record, while the $112,000 in merchandise was the third biggest in company history trailing only the recent Nitros in Philadelphia and Boston. The crowd was super hot for much of the show which gave the show a great feel, and a lot of the wrestling was good as well. The show opened with the NWO coming to the building and Hogan and Rodman doing an interview challenging Luger and Giant for later in the show. As it turned out, both WCW and WWF teased in their opening segments a main event match, WWF teasing Ken Shamrock vs. Steve Austin, that neither company ever delivered. Rodman was clearly up to speed as he both times referred to Luger as Lex Luthor, the heel character in the Superman comic books. Glacier beat Mortis with the cryonic kick in 216 and afterwards Wrath joined in beating up Glacier. Ernest Miller made the save. Mortis has a lot of potential as a wrestler but this angle is getting lame and stale very quickly. Medusa did an interview still limping and crying about the match the previous night. It was really bad. Dean Malenko beat Chavo Guerrero Jr. with the Cloverleaf in 338. Eddie Guerrero watched the match and acted like a heel, and never helped his nephew. Guerrero was doing heel interviews backstage and people were both surprised and thrilled as how good a job he did in his new role. Super Colo pinned La Parca in 344 with an ankle scissors off the top rope rolled into a cradle. Aside from one great tope by Colo, the match wasn't that good. After the match Parca literally destroyed Colo with a sickening shot with a plastic chair. Colo legitimately was out backstage for a long time and taken to the hospital where he needed stitches on both his forehead and his nose and may have suffered a concussion. Word we got is that Parka actually felt worse because of guilt. Harlem Heat beat French Canadians in 337 when Booker T pinned Jacques after the Big Apple, a high side kick. J.J. Dillon did an interview saying that due to what happened the previous night, that Steiners and Heat would have a rematch to determine who gets the tag title shot at the August pay-per-view on June 23rd Nitro from Macon, Georgia. Heat complained. Vincent came out and said he had done them a favor the previous night and both Heat members destroyed Vincent. Six kept the cruiserweight title beating Rey Mysterio Jr. in 447 of a very good TV match. Mysterio Jr. did an awesome flip dive over the post to the floor. He had six beaten with Aura Conrana off the top when Nash and Hall went to interfere. Mysterio Jr. thwarted their attempts to a huge pop when he spin kicked Nash who sold the move, but was caught with a kick by Six and the buzzkiller submission. After the match, Nash power bombed Mysterio Jr. Hall, Nash and Savage did an interview and Page was in the crowd and challenged Hall and Savage to a tag match with a mystery partner and looked to the sky to indicate his partner would be Sting. Ultimo Dragon pinned Chris Jericho in 439 with a Tiger suplex. Pretty good, although these two have had numerous better matches. Jericho seemed nervous and rushing things because of the short time the match was given. Roddy Piper and Ric Flair did an interview that went absolutely nowhere. Piper actually got booed as he knocked Rodman in the one city where Rodman would be cheered. Flair never explained why he disappeared the night before, and at the end they simply blew off their angle, which may be a total blow-off, or a tease and they'll do the angle in a week or two. Scott Norton and Marcus Bagwell beat Jeff Jarrett and Steve McMichael in 709 when McMichael turned on Jarrett and Pyle drove him, and Bagwell made the pin. Fans cheered McMichael like crazy since he was a star with the Bears, but still booed Jarrett big time, and there was a huge pop when McMichael gave Jarrett the pile driver. Deborah sided with Steve on this one so they dropped the plans of putting Deborah exclusively with Jarrett. Bagwell looked real good. They spent the entire show teasing Hogan and Rodman vs. Luger and Giant to the point Bobby Heenan referred to it as the biggest match ever in the history of Chicago wrestling, somehow I think the history books would have still remembered Gotch vs. Hockenschmidt or Rogers vs. O'Connor ahead of it 100 years from now. Anyway Hogan hit Luger with the belt and Giant had Rodman up for the choke slam but Hogan hit Giant with the belt. 
Hall, Nash, Six and later Savage all came out and they ended up spray painting NWO on Luger and Giant's back while the ring literally filled up with debris. The angle got super heat and was great when it comes to building up the pay-per-view. Nitro drew a 3.33 rating, 2.83 first hour, 3.83 seconds hour, and 5.71 share while Raw did a 2.36 rating, 2.28 first hour, 2.45 seconds hour and a 3.95 share. The Nitro replay did another near record 1.9 rating and 4.6 share. As for quarter hour comparisons, WCW opened with a 2.7 for the Hogan and Raman entrance and interview and Glacier Mortis matched to a 2.0 for WWF which was a long Austin interview, with Mankind and Shamrock coming out, and a Pillman interview. WCW continued a slow growth throughout the hour to a 3.0, while Rod did the same slow growth to a 2.5. The ECW segment with Christopher vs. Condito did a 2.3 while WCW had Parker vs. Colo at 2.9. WCW got a huge bump from 3.0 to 3.9 for the 6th vs. Mysterio Jr. match while WWF stayed steady at 2.5 for the long-awaited Pillman vs. Austin match. WWF peaked at 2.9 for the Pillman-Austin finish and post-match angle with Bulldust, Shamrock, Austin and LOD forming their team while WCW fell to a 3.4 for Dragon vs. Jericho and the Piper interview. WCW was back up to 3.9 for the remainder of the Piper interview when Flair came out, and the Norton and Bagwell vs. Jarrett and McMichael match, while WWF fell from 2.9 to 2.0 for Tommy Rogers vs. Bobby Fulton and Lawler, and Van Dam vs. Headbangers. For the final quarter hour, in which WCW teased the Hogan and Rodman vs. Luger and Giant match and did the wild angle, WCW peaked at a 4.1, while WWF did a 2.4 for Undertaker and Johnson vs. Kama and Farouk match and angle. Other weekend numbers saw main event at 1.0, Saturday night at 2.2 despite it being the best Saturday show in a long time, and pro at a pitiful 1.1. Most of the big names left for a tour of Germany on June 17th. Tour ends on June 22nd so everyone will be back for the Nitro on June 23rd. Sting was scheduled to wrestle on this tour, billed as WCW vs. NWO. As far as the Nash Piper situation on June 9th a few clarifications. Apparently Nash kicked down the door of Piper's dressing room, and started screaming and swearing at him about the match before they did a shove and kick deal. Killer Kowalski was backstage at the WCW show in Boston. EMLL promoter Paco Alonso had no idea that Silver King was in WCW this past week. What happened was that Cyclope was supposed to work the TV on June 9th and June 11th, but he was stopped at the border as he didn't have the correct paperwork. Since EMLL had a tour in Monterey, which is a northern Mexico city, they desperately searched for someone to take his place and they talked Silver King into coming with the idea that if he came in, he could get a WCW contract. However, since Eric Bischoff is trying to work out an agreement with Alonso, so he would have another ally in Mexico for obvious reasons and also to freeze Titan out of the Mexican market since that's the country which right now is producing the best good new talent, what may end up happening is that Silver King will have to stay with EMLL rather than join Promo Azteca as was the original agreement since Bischoff doesn't want Conan stealing Alonzo's talent while they are negotiating a deal. It's still too early to tell how this will all end up. Bischoff was at a company meeting this past week and said that WCW would be doing two to three Lucha Libre pay-per-view shows per year and that he would be traveling to Mexico sometime next week to try and finalize the deal with Alonzo and Televisa. There are a lot of political ramifications in Mexico regarding this. Bischoff has either gotten signed or gotten the agreements from all the key Lucha Libre wrestlers in WCW for WCW to own their worldwide rights. Initially WCW only had their rights for the United States and I believe Japanese markets and they dealt for themselves in Mexico. The problems were that since WCW never gets its booking done far ahead of time, and Mexico always does things at the last minute, that guys would get booked in Mexico for dates and then WCW would want them on the same dates. There have also been lots of problems with guys arriving late to arena shows forcing changes in the house show cards and cancellation of matches due to transportation problems in Mexico so they want the wrestlers to leave a day early rather than the day of, which would mean them giving up a potential previous night booking in Mexico. If Bischoff makes a deal with Televisa and Alonso it could result in the group being forced out of promo Azteca and doing an NWO angle in Mexico against the EMLL crew or even not being able to work Mexico at all if that's what Bischoff wants although obviously by getting their rights to Mexico it wasn't to keep them from working Mexico but to make him a major power broker in the Mexican marketplace. Raven's debut has been held back because he hadn't signed his contract yet, but he may have before you read this. 
Mysterio Jr. got another opinion on his bad knee from a doctor who said that he doesn't need reconstructive surgery but advised him to sit out two months to rest it, and the plan seems to be for him to sit out the months of July and August. Los Angeles for June 28 had sold 6,700 tickets for $156,000. No word on WWF numbers for the same day but I'd safely assume WCW is ahead. The Los Angeles show will air live on the internet on the WCW website. They'll have live play-by-play and show a series of still photos of the matches off the Diamond Vision screen. Brian Knobs will be returning but Jerry Sags won't be with him as he's still got the neck problem. CNN did a piece this week on the power plant. The August 9th pay-per-view show has been renamed Road Wild instead of Hog Wild because Hog is a registered mark of the Harley Owners Group and they were causing legal problems over WCW using the name. Both Kevin Green and Dennis Rodman made a ton of mainstream press over the past week. Green is holding out of minicamp and in the Charlotte area there was a lot of talk about when he should have been in camp, he was out doing pro wrestling. This is probably Green's final year in the NFL and his contract calls for $650,000, which is likely way below his current market value as a pro bowler and NFL sack leader, and he's trying to get it up to $1 million. At the pay-per-view show backstage, Green was talking about being burned out on football although he may be using WCW as negotiating leverage to get his football deal, which has been done by several football players dating back to Ernie Ladd and Bronco Nagurski in the past. Besides the Chicago Bulls winning the NBA title, Rodman made some stupid remarks about Mormons that got him a $50,000 fine by the NBA and tons of negative pub everywhere. It's really weird how things evolve. Years ago it seemed like WCW was working under a dark cloud and usually all the breaks went the WWF's way, and now WCW lucks into publicity left and right and WWF has had an incredible string of bad luck. WCW Saturday night was taped on June 11th in Birmingham, Alabama before a sellout 3000 paying $30,000. The show that aired this past weekend was actually worth watching due to two very good matches. Actually the Lucha Six Man with Psicosis and Silver King and Damien beating Ultimo Dragon and Juventud Guerrera and La Parca when Psicosis pinned Dragon was a four-stars match, far better than the Nitro match of two days earlier. Best match on Saturday night in probably more than one year. They also had a US title match with Malenko beating Jarrett via DQ when McMichael hit Malenko with the briefcase for the title save in what was also a very good match. In bouts that will air on June 21st, Kolo and Guerrera have a tag match against Silver King and La Parca. Six beats Chris Jericho in a cruiserweight title match and Norton and Bagwell lose to Luger and Giant. Taylor wanted to book Jericho to beat Six for the cruiserweight belt a few weeks back but the title change wasn't nixed, but it was postponed, so it should happen sometime soon. The feeling from the NWO is that since Six had just done the big job in Charlotte, they wanted him to get a few wins like the Mysterio Jr. won on Nitro to build his heat back up before the upset loss of the title. Bob Probert of the Chicago Blackhawks was originally going to work the June 16th Nitro being in Flair's corner in a rematch against Hall. The feeling was they didn't want to have anything detract from the Robin appearance and with all the star power on that show and Flair having wrestled so much on Nitro of late, they really didn't need to put him in the ring this week. There has been talk of making Hugh Morris into the third member of Public Enemy although that's far from a done deal. At the June 6th show in Buffalo, Jim Kelly, unbeknownst to Savage, after causing him to lose to Page dropped a series of elbows on him. WWF Raw as War drew 2,773 paying $45,726 to the Olympic Center in Lake Placid, New York. It was a bad show in front of a small crowd in a large arena that wasn't reacting well, with a lot of dud matches and a lot of new faces and angles that really didn't seem to get over. The difference in crowd enthusiasm between Nitro and Raw was huge and the difference in work rate was even more pronounced. Much of the television had to be changed due to all sorts of problems including the four wrestlers being unavailable because of the car accident. Show opened with Steve Austin doing an interview and both Mankind and Ken Shamrock ended up involved before it was over and Shamrock challenged Austin to a match and Austin accepted for later that night after his match with Brian Pillman. In a match in a tournament to determine the number one contenders for the tag team titles, Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith beat Black Jacks in 338 when Smith pinned Bradshaw after Hart used a spin kick in a total nothing match. Hunter Hearst Helmsley pinned Phineas Godwin in 337 with the pedigree in another nothing match with the only spot getting a pop when Godwin kissed China. After the match Henry Godwin came out and started yelling at Phineas, and then screamed at Vince McMahon that it was all his fault, and McMahon said, I guess everything is my fault now. 
Chris Condito beat Brian Christopher in 245 of what was billed as an ECW vs. USWA match via DQ when Jerry Lawler interfered. Condito worked hard but the crowd, aside from very few ECW fans, didn't care at all about the match. On the big stage, Christopher didn't get over at all. Nowadays a small wrestler has to be a spectacular 90s style worker to get over, and Christopher was doing the 80s style, and at his size, it meant nothing to fans who have seen so much. Really, the match was too short to do either of them justice and Christopher is good enough on interviews that he can get over in that way given time. Personally my belief is this was a big step down for ECW. Feuding with the Major League WWF elevates ECW but feuding with USWA anywhere but in the USWA territory just establishes them as another Bush League promotion at a time where positioning and perception are everything in wrestling. Paul Heyman was at ringside and said that Christopher was Lawler's son, which brought Lawler out and he slapped Heyman but quickly jumped in the ring. Heyman also said that Christopher's mother was 38 years old to give the idea that she was 12 when she had Brian playing off Lawler's embarrassing arrest ordeal of a few years back. It was Lawler's idea to have Heyman bring up Christopher being his son. Tommy Dreamer made the save. The plan on paper was to do Dreamer vs. Condito, but Heyman nixed that idea because he didn't want Dreamer wrestling on television nationally without Beulah and because they were limited in what they could do as far as brawling and Dreamer can't get over as a wrestler inside the ring without gimmicks. They showed a video of Owen and Bret Hart and Smith from Toronto on June 14th, trying to establish that the Hart Foundation are huge babyfaces in Canada to set up a storyline for Calgary. Actually the Toronto crowd seemed to boo Brett in the clip. Goldust pinned Jim Neidhart in 347 after a punch to the face with Neidhart doing his USA Network selling on 7 second delay. It was awful. McMahon and Jim Ross tried to play the result as being a huge upset. Austin beat Pillman in 1141 via DQ. They handcuffed Owen Bulldog and Neidhart to the corners. Where have we seen handcuffs before? Aside from one great bump where he crotched himself on the ropes, Pillman didn't do much. Austin gave the ref a stunner for no apparent reason. With the ref out, Owen grabbed the key from his pants and unlocked himself, and then Bulldog and Neidhart were all unlocked and they destroyed Austin until Mankind, Bulldust and Shamrock made the save. Somewhere in all this, Mankind disappeared. Austin tried to jump Shamrock, who gave him a belly to belly. Austin appeared to back down from Shamrock but then attacked him again and they went at it until Goldust and the Legion of Doom pulled them apart. Goldust then suggested that all five of them form a team for Calgary which got a surprisingly little crowd pop. In what was billed as a light heavyweight division match, Tommy Rogers pinned Bobby Fulton in 358. It was acknowledged they were the Fantastics and held the Mid-South, Southern and U.S. tag team titles but had since split up. Crowd chanted boring even though the guys were working hard. They are making the same mistake WCW did when it first started the cruiser division pushing guys like Brad Armstrong and Joey Maggs. The division didn't mean a thing until the wrestlers with a style people had never seen before showed up, and even though Rogers and Fulton were good workers for their day, their style is passé for guys of that size. In another tournament match, Headbangers beat Lawler and Rob Van Dam in 358, when Sandman interfered giving Lawler a low blow with his cane. Sandman didn't smoke a cigarette or drink a beer, apparently as a political concession to appearing on the show. After the match, Van Dam, Dreamer, and Sandman fought over the rail, Finale saw Farouk and partner Charles Wright, now billed as Kama Mustafa, over Undertaker and Ahmed Johnson in 609 of a bad match. Kama showed up really out of shape. Obviously they've totally dropped the idea of using him as Papa Shango. Crowd was dead when he was in there and literally stunned when with little build up, he pinned Undertaker clean with a urinoe. It's like Undertaker has popped up from monsters like Vader and Yokozuna's big moves, but this out of shape never was does a move that isn't even over in this country on him and he lays there and sells it for a long time after the match. Johnson turned on him after giving him the Pearl River plunge. I understand WWF needs new talent and there is no quality new talent in this country, so they have to go back to retreads. But as we've seen time after time the day of bringing in large guys with no talents other than large is over, and guys like Brian Lee, Charles Wright, Crush and the like may look like they've got Titan written all over them because of their size, but Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart have changed what the Titan look is. Lee is headed in to form a tag team with Crush called the Nielsen Death Squad. That's a joke. Helmsley wasn't in any trouble over the interview on the June 9th show. In fact, the major points of that interview were scripted by the office. The spot with Shawn Michaels and the mentally handicapped kid at the King of the Ring pay-per-view was not planned. Prelim estimates are King of the Ring did in 0.46 buy rate which would be about 129,000 buys and $1.54 million which would be well down from last year.
The address for info on the Ken Shamrock videos mentioned in last week's issue and other Lions Den merchandise is P.O. Box 607, Clements, California 95227. Bader's trial in Kuwait on June 10th was postponed until June 24. WWF has hired a new announcer named Michael Cole, who did the Shotgun Show over this past weekend with Jim Cornette. Don't know anything about Cole but reports we heard were that it was obvious he didn't know much and Cornette was carrying him. Former WWF ring announcer Lance Wright, after being let go, is back in his old job with ECW. Don't know what the weekend lineups will be between the injuries to the four men in the car wreck, Michaels being out and Vader being questionable. They are doing some bouts with Farouk and Johnson and Kama versus Pillman and Owen and Neidhart at the house shows the next two weeks. Weekend house show saw Montreal on June 13 do 5,562 and $113,688, June 14 in Toronto did 14615 and $255,166 and June 15 in Ottawa drew $3,880 and $78,062. Montreal was said to be really bad with fans being far more unruly than usual and no matches better than one and one half star. Maine was supposed to be Undertaker vs. Austin, but Austin's flight was delayed in Cincinnati. They stalled the show out waiting for him, but finally had to put Bulldog in the main event and they stalled through a nearly 30 minutes match before Undertaker won in Austin. Who finally arrived, hit the ring and used the stunner on Bulldog Pillman on and Undertaker to a big pop. Bulldog had pinned Sid, replacing Michaels, earlier in the show. Toronto was a huge success and did an additional $129,254 in merchandise. Undertaker pinned Austin on top there. Mankind subbed for Michaels and lost to Bulldog, Ottawa was a weird show since it had to be redone after the car wreck and most of the guys because of the car wreck weren't in the mood to work. Undertaker beat Austin. In a weird match, Owen and Pillman and Bulldog beat LOD and Johnson in a match where the Hart Foundation were the total babyfaces. It wound up with special ref Ken Shamrock giving Animal the belly to belly to get a face pop for Shamrock and leading to the finish where Owen pinned Hawk. The plans right now are for some ECW exposure every week on Raw leading to SummerSlam and ECW's second pay-per-view show. Johnson personally resisted the idea of turning heel so his joining Nation of Domination is going to be explained in a way where he hasn't necessarily gone heel. Technically, to build up syndicated ratings, they've renamed the first hour of Raw simply Raw and the second hour as the War Zone trying to get syndicated ratings from them as two different programs. During a news conference in Toronto to build up the Toronto vs. Hamilton Canadian Football League game over the weekend, Farouk jumped Toronto's Mike Clemens in a worked football angle for Canadian TV cameras and Farouk was pulled back by Hamilton coach Donald Sutherland. Farouk, in his former life as Ron Simmons, was a member of the Hamilton Tiger Cats defensive line during the 1981 season where they went all the way to the Grey Cup. The CFL Championship Game Weekend TV ratings saw Livewire at 1.1 and Superstars at 1.5. They did an angle in Lake Placid, New York, which I don't think will be televised on Shotgun, where referee Earl Heckner jumped ring announcer Howard Finkel. Every so often they do angles to make Finkel the butt of their jokes such as doing several angles with Harvey Whippleman, the famous bushwhacker march in his underwear and the time Kurt Hennig and Shawn Michaels busted up his car on a live Raw show in the parking lot unbeknownst to him ahead of time. The only major things on Shotgun were Christopher getting to beat Rogers, Mankind over Rockabilly and the new nation of domination beating three jobbers. Legion of Doom and Godwins had a confrontation leading to a match which takes place on Raw from Detroit on June 23rd and Dark Match saw Mankind and Undertaker and Shamrock over Owen and Bulldog and Neidhart when Shamrock made Neidhart tap. The Reader's Pages King of Ring as a long-time reader of The Observer, I realized that 1993 wasn't the first King of the Ring tournament. In the past, you've printed the winners of King of the Ring tournaments that weren't on pay-per-view. For my records, could you please reprint who the finalists were in the past tournaments? Dave Kerstetter. Burlington, New Jersey. Response from Dave Meltzer. The history of King of the Ring finalists is, the first was July 14, 1986 at Foxborough Stadium with Harley Race beating Pedro Morales to earn the name King Harley Race. The second was October 16, 1988 in Providence with Ted DiBiase beating Randy Savage. The third was October 14, 1989 in Providence with Tito Santana beating Rick Martel. The fourth was September 7, 1991 in Providence with Bret Hart beating IRS. The fifth was June 13, 1993 in Dayton with Bret Hart beating Bam Bam Bigelow, which was the first King of the Ring pay-per-view show and when it became an annual event. June 16, 1994 in Baltimore saw Owen Hart beat Razor Ramon to become the King of Hearts. 
June 25, 1995 in Philadelphia saw Mabel beat Savio Vega to become King Mabel. June 23, 1996 in Milwaukee saw Steve Austin beat Jake Roberts. Bits and Pieces I personally rated Steven Regal vs. Ultimo Dragon as 4 stars or more and I was also very impressed with Yuji Yasuriyoka so I rated that match higher as well. I also felt the booking style of Yoshihiro Asai on the Rey Mysterio Jr. vs. Yasuriyoka match. I was very happy to see three complete Japanese-style matches on the pay-per-view show. Roller Games as it was known in Japan was huge at one point. They had a superstar named Yoko Sasaki of the Tokyo Bombers and her long hair was always pulled by for example Miller of the Los Angeles Thunderbirds. It was the classic Japanese versus American sports format and we love that sport so much. We have many similar and sad stories about roller games after its demise and your articles on Joan Weston brought me back many memories and reminded me to think about sports entertainment from another perspective. Yoji Anjo vs Masahito Kakihara was totally cool and twice as good as Ken Shamrock vs Vader? That was also my initial response, particularly of Shamrock's first pay-per-view match. It was a good match and I agree with what you wrote about it, however the Japanese with Kingdom and recent rings have taken semi-shoot style to another level, so unless it's something spectacular, I'm not that impressed by imitations. Lisa Hunt vs. Donna Cawthorn on the USWF April 12th show as the best cult match so far of 1997. I loved it. Yes, the heat was great for that show but as for the technical level of the USWF wrestlers, I don't think I'd recommend any of them to a Japanese promotion.